Hi, today we're going to be discussing the results from the light intensity versus distance experiment. We wanted to find out two main things. Firstly, did the light intensity from that torch obey an inverse square law of distance? So as we move the probe away and increase the distance between that and the torch that I was using, was it obeying an inverse square law? So was it falling off so that the values were obeying that law? Um, the, the second thing we wanted to find out is, could we determine the power output of the torch from light intensity measurements at different distances? So determining the power at source. Light measurements for a point source of light would obey that inverse square law, but we were using a torch. So let's have a think about how the light could possibly behave in that case. So what we have here is if this is our torch over here, um, we could have something like this where the light is spreading out as it moves away from the bulb like this. So it's spreading out like this and the beam forms a circle, doesn't it? Over here, so it forms a circular pattern. So we've got, what we've got here is the light is following this conical shape. And so if it is spreading out in this very regular conical way like this, uh, then let's have a think about the geometry of the problem. So here we are at distance small r from the light source. Okay, that distance there is little r. If we say the radius of that circle is capital R, and then if we took the center line here, we'll define that angle there as theta. So we've got little r, large r, theta. The area here is a circle, okay, so that's cross-sectional area A. So uh, these two r's are related to each other, aren't they? This is the adjacent side, this is the opposite of a right angle triangle. So we can say that tan theta is the opposite divided by the adjacent. So what that enables us to do is get r, large r, in terms of small r and theta. So we can write r equals r tan theta. And since this is the area of a circle of radius large r, a is pi r squared. So therefore it is pi times r squared tan squared theta. Okay. So that's our expression there for A. And then intensity is power of the source divided by the area that it's covering. So I would be P over A, which is P over pi R squared tan squared theta. Now these terms here, the pi and the tan squared theta are constant, okay, because we're saying the, the, the energy, we, we're assuming that it's spreading out in that very straight conical way, so we can write that as p over pi tan squared theta, put that in brackets, and we can multiply that by 1 over r squared, or r to the minus 2. So, this is the equation that we'll be putting up to the test. That's the ge based on the geometry of the problem. Now I know that lasers do behave like this in, in a certain range. And so it might be a case that the torch obeys it in a certain range as well, but not um, all the time. So lasers kind of have, have a bit of curvature to the way the light spreads out to begin with. And then um, after that, they have a region where they do spread out in this kind of straight conical way. Uh, it may be the same for the torch. But let's have a look at the data and see what happens. So let me switch over to this screen. Okay, so this is the spreadsheet we'll be using to do the number crunching for us. Here's the equation that we'll be using to do the analysis. That, I just explained where that came from. So hopefully 
that's all understandable now. Uh, so we start with some constants. Okay, so the first thing is the efficiency of an LED. The torch was an LED torch, so we're going to use that efficiency in a later stage in the analysis. Theta. Now I used a bit of a rough and ready method for determining the angle here, theta. Uh, and what that was, I, I took the intensity probe and I moved it across the beam at certain places and I just looked for where the intensity started to drop off dramatically. So I was looking for a relatively constant bit of intensity. So we, we, this is not perfect by any means. And a much better method would be connect your probe to a data logger and then move it across uh, nice constant velocity across the beam and you should get a pattern where the, uh, the light as he shoots up and then drops off and you could use that to determine the diameter. But I haven't used that, hopefully this is a good approximation. Really. So 2.8 degrees is what we're using for that. Okay, um, so we were measuring over these distances here, 10 centimetres to 100 centimetres. I, I've put those in centimetres here and then I've just done a conversion into metres here, so just dividing that by 100. Okay, and then these are the r to the minus 2 values, we'll be plotting those on the graph. So here we have the power equation, so power of this value here and the the power that I'm raising it to is minus two, so it's uh, very straightforward. So it's working out the reciprocal of that squared in mathematical terms. Okay, so what we're going to do over here. Now I've got repeat readings for intensity, so I'm going to put the first set in here with the corresponding distance, and then the second set will go over here. These are in kilo lux. This works out the average of these two, and just using the built-in average formula, and then this gives us the intensity in lux. So here, all I'm doing is multiplying that by 1,000. So it's easier in kilo lux. Convert back into lux, we just multiply by 1,000. So these are the values going in. Um, I'm not going into the spreadsheet formulae in quite as much detail as I have done in a couple of the other videos, um, because probably you get the idea by now having watched uh, some of the other videos that I've made about uh, spreadsheets and if you haven't then the capacitor discharge and the Planck's constant I really talked through spreadsheet formula in detail so this one I'll go a little bit quicker. Right let's put some kilolux values in so starting at 10 centimeters we got 10.86 second reading was 9.75 you can see the average automatically calculating, and then we've got the intensity there. All right, there we go. So these are the values that I measured in video one. Uh, there's the average, there's the values in lux. Great, so what we're gonna do first is see how that came out on a straight line graph, plotting r to the minus two versus the intensity. So it's down here. Now, because of the nature of the data, you'll notice that a lot of the data points got bunched up down the bottom here. Okay, so lots of data points down here and then quite spread out here. I can see that there's a bit of curvature divergence from the straight line. So don't know how good that data is. Obviously, if we ignored that point, it would be closer to the straight line. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's just take that. Um, we could exclude that one on a later occasion. Okay, so uh, the gradient is 102.71 and the uh, y-intercept is 95.987. Like I said, a bit of divergence, but let's assume that it was okay. Uh, so this is where we need to take the gradient. So it's 102.7 here. 
And then to calculate the output power, what we do is we equate the gradients of this part of the equation. So if we compare this to y equals mx plus c, on the y-axis we've got i, on the x-axis I've plotted r to the minus 2, 1 over r squared, okay? So this portion of the equation is equal to the gradient. We want to determine p, so p is going to be equal to gradient multiplied by pi tan squared theta. Theta was 2.8 degrees, already noted that, so we put that in there, this is all constant. So we take our gradient of 102.7, multiply it by pi, multiply it by tan squared theta. So if I just put this up here, hopefully it's a bit more visible. So there's my value for the gradient there, multiplied by pi. Then I put this in brackets, the tan. Because uh, spreadsheets need the, the, they work in radians for the trigonometric functions. So I've converted the constant, the, the theta value into radians here, passed it into the tan function. So that's what that's doing. And then I square that, that's in brackets. So this is all multiplied by the result of the square function there. Okay, so what that gave me is 0.76 output power. So this is the output power from the bulb at um, these distances on average, okay? So that's what that value represents in watts, 0.76. Then what I did is the torch is powered by a battery. So I got the manufacturer power rating of the battery. At this setting for that torch, it was 0.85 watts so we're on 0 0.76 0 0.85 oh no sorry okay so um that's the output power for the light bulb at, on average for those distances right then what i did is the the efficiency of the leds is 90 percent, so 0 0.9 we take this value and we divide it over here so the input power is that output power divided by the efficiency. So what that gives me is the power of the battery, okay, um, for, for this output power of the bulb. Now the manufacturer power, so this is the power output for that battery on this setting and that torch is 0 0.90 watts. And so if I do a percentage difference comparison between this and this, we get 5% or 5.7% percent percentage difference. So that does show a good agreement between the power rating that we calculated and the expected value. So that, that suggests that yes, perhaps the, the, we are obeying an inverse square law, but we did notice and we did note that there is a bit of curvature creeping into our graph here. So that's something that I would take in my evaluation and say, well, maybe not. Could be, maybe not. So like I said, if over a certain range, the, the beam behaves in the way that we've assumed it would behave, that could give a reason why it's a bit close. But let's do a, a more rigorous test for the proportionality, okay? Um, just for good measure, I'm going to do both proportionality tests, direct proportionality and inverse proportionality. So what I've taken is, these are the R values that we were using. Um, I calculate I divided by R squared here, because if you have direct proportionality, then all these values would be constant. Okay, you can see they're clearly not constant, so good. It's, I is not directly proportional to R squared. What about the inverse proportionality, well, if you take i and you multiply it by r squared, then all these should be constant if they are inversely proportional. Um, so uh, the values here, you can see they are actually going up. They're much, we're getting much more strongly, we're getting much better agreement here. But over here, you can see that the values are going up. So perhaps over this range here, they are not inversely proportional, and maybe here they are. Maybe if we took more measurements, we could verify that. 
So on the basis of this, I'd say um, in this range, they're probably not inversely proportional. There's probably a bit more complexity to it than, than what we've assumed. Uh, so um, I would want to see if from maybe 70 centimetres upwards or even beyond 100 centimetres, if the, if, if the data was showing that they were inversely proportional over that range. So that would be a good ex a next step to, to do with this experiment to see if that was the case. So what have we done? We thought about the geometry of the problem and come up with a suggested equation that we could use uh, to investigate this data. We did get a good result for the output power and therefore the input, input power from the battery. Uh, it showed quite close agreement. But this data is suggesting that that might have been a bit lucky. Uh, and in fact, um, if we did some more rigorous testing of the beam width, that might help us see actually um, we should refine the angle th theta and that would perhaps throw this out. So the, the proportionality data here is suggesting maybe we need to look at a, large, a different range to, uh, to get that inverse proportional relationship. I hope you found that helpful. I'm trying to get some more of my analysis videos done. I've got a few to do and I've also got some experiment ones that I've got on file but I just haven't got around to processing and I hope to get those out to you as soon as possible.